What type of men were these warriors from the sky who jumped from an airplane with 100 pounds of equipment into the night under fire and into enemy territory? This film will attempt to explain these questions by following one of these men, Don Malarkey of Oregon, and his comrades through training and into their first few days of combat. E Company, or Easy, was part of a newly formed experimental unit, the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, commanded by Colonel Robert Sink. The commanding officer of Easy was Lieutenant Herbert Sobel. The 10 companies, able through item of the 506, would go throughout their entire training together. Like all military companies, Easy was divided into three platoons and a headquarters section. Each platoon had three squads of 12 men with one 30 caliber machine gun in each squad. A six-man, 60-millimeter mortar team was also in each platoon. Easy, as well as the other companies that had to go through training, had to look forward to a rigorous weeding out program. Any man who could not cut the physical part of the training that was meant to be tougher than combat was immediately sent out of the unit. One of the first experiences of weeding out was the run up a three-mile high mountain known as Mount Kurahi. The meaning of this local Indian name? We stand alone together. By the end of the training, the name of this mountain and its meaning would become the 506 motto. Besides running the seven miles up and down Kurahi, the prospective paratroopers also had to do daily calisthenics, push-ups, sit-ups, deep knee bends, and grueling obstacle courses. A 35-foot tower was their first experience to what it would be like to jump from an aircraft. All this was done prior to getting anywhere near an airplane or a parachute. The training was physically and mentally demanding. The drill instructors had a saying, we can't make you do anything, but we can make you wish you had. Before Easy and the rest of the 506 could go to jump school near Atlanta, Georgia, their commanding officer, Colonel Sink, decided to have them break a marching record set by the Japanese Army. The Japanese had previously marched 100 miles in 72 hours. Sink believed his men could do better, so on December 1, 1942, at 0700 hours, 2nd Battalion of the 506th, which Easy Company was part of, started with their march towards Atlanta. They marched 40 miles that first day through rain, wind, and mud before stopping for the night at 2100 hours. After the second day's march, Don Malarkey laid down before getting something to eat. He quickly realized this was a bad idea. From the constant marching on the hard roads, he found that his leg muscles had cramped up so badly that he could not stand up. The next morning he struggled to his feet and began marching, even after Lieutenant Winters recommended he ride in the ambulance. For the next two days they marched over 80 miles. When they finally arrived they had covered 118 miles in 75 hours. A new record had been made. That weekend Lieutenant Winters allowed Malarkey to take the weekend off to stay in his cot to recover. Fort Benning became the 506th and Easy's new home. Also known as the frying pan, Benning was the base where all prospective paratroopers received their jump training. The training was divided into four stages, each stage lasting one week. Stage A was the physical training portion which the men from Tekoa did not have to participate in due to the fact that they were in better shape than the instructors. Stage B introduced the men to how the parachute worked by allowing them to pack and repack parachutes. After lunch they would practice jumping from a platform four feet high to practice the correct way to land. They also would practice how to turn, slip, and avoid collisions by hanging in a suspended harness. Upon successful completion of C stage, the troopers moved to D stage. This is where they were required to make five actual jumps from a C-47 aircraft. After making their five jumps, one of which was conducted at night, the men of Easy became fully certified paratroopers. After a brief R&R, &R, the new paratroopers came back to Fort Benning. In January of 1943 and throughout the summer, they began their advanced portion of infantry paratrooper training that was also conducted at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. August, the division was sent to Camp Shanks, New York for inoculations and preparation for loading onto troop ships. This was to get ready to travel to their position in the war. They slowly left New York Harbor, wondering if they would ever see the inviting sight of the Statue of Liberty again and looking forward to what lay ahead. On September 15th, the troop ship Samaria docked in Liverpool and the men were transferred to their new home, Aldbourne, 80 miles west of London. Training continued for the next few months, training that was said to be tough. Tukoa like tough. It had to be for what lay ahead. On the tarmac of the Up Pottery Airfield in England, serials 5 and 6 began packing and checking their equipment for the invasion of Hitler's Fortress Europe. The day is June 5, 1944. At 11.50, the planes of these serials took off from Up Pottery. 
with over 1,300 paratroopers. A two-hour flight over found Private First Class Don Malarkey sleeping most of the way, probably from the motion sickness pills that were issued before the invasion. He did not wake until within view of the Jersey and Guernsey Islands. The planes were out to take a route where they would come in at Continin Peninsula from the east, fly over the entire peninsula in 10 minutes, and exit out over the beach area where the amphibious landings were to take place. Easy Company's pilots were to look for green lights on the drop zones that their pathfinders had set up for them, signaling them to drop their troops. Of the 81 C-47s to drop troops in drop zone C, only 10 hit their mark. The rest were scattered throughout the area. Most of Easy Company came down five miles north of the drop zone. This massive scattering of troops was not supposed to happen, but in some ways it was a positive. The Germans, not knowing where the paratroopers were concentrating because of missed drops, began wasting time in their efforts trying to figure out what all the different reports meant. This was time they needed in order to organize a counterattack to push the Allies back when the amphibious assault came. 2nd Battalion had scattered, but not so badly as the rest of the regiment. They were able to assemble faster and more complete than any other unit in the regiment. When POC Malarkey got to the door of the C-47, he was the third man out. His plane was traveling at 200 miles per hour at about 275 feet altitude. When he jumped, he remembers it as far from a normal jump. The first thing I saw as I went out the door was hedgerow line fields, two farm roads in north. The trip to the ground was not long. Malarkey's chute drifted over a large elm tree, which made his landing easy and probably saved him from being injured. After he worked his way out of his chute and collected his gear, he made his way over to where Bill Garnier landed. There were three of us together from 18 men on my stick, Bill Garnier, Joe Toy, and myself. As the three troopers moved into the hedgerows, they began looking for the rest of the unit. About a quarter mile down the road, the trio heard a cart moving their way. They quickly jumped into a hedge and prepared for a hasty ambush. As the car slowly approached, Malarkey noticed that there were about 12 to 15 German soldiers, mostly rear echelon types, with a cart full of ammunition. They were a small supply group moving toward the coast. The trio quickly jumped out of their hiding place and captured the group without firing a shot. They cleared them of their weapons and instructed them to walk down the center of the road and they would be all right. ways down the road, one of the prisoners made a gap in the ditch. Sergeant Garnier leveled his Thompson submachine gun and fired, killing the German. No other Germans attempted to escape. As they neared the coastal road, they met up with more U.S. troopers, got rid of the POWs, and began moving towards their objectives. As a newly formed unit moved out, an American paratrooper with a thick Philadelphia accent asked the German POWs resting along the side of the road, where are you boys from? To Malarkey's astonishment, a German master sergeant answered with a perfect American accent, Portland, Oregon. He asked the German, what are you doing here? He explained that back in 1938, Hitler had sent out a decree that all Aryans were to return to Germany. He said before leaving the United States, he had worked at Schmidt Steel Company in Portland. Malarkey couldn't believe what he was hearing. He had worked at Monarch right across the street. Before leaving his unusual reunion, Malarkey asked him one last question. What do you think of yourself now? The German replied, I think I made a mistake. Around 0830, they met up with others from Easy Company in a small group of three or four buildings known as Le Grand Chamin. They were there only about 10 minutes when Lieutenant Richard Winters, the acting company commander, ordered them and eight other Easy Company men to move out to attack an artillery position firing on the troops at Utah Beach. The makeup of this small assault force was only 12 men. Lieutenant Winters would take seven or eight men to attack the first artillery gun. Private Malarkey was to skirt the hedge grow towards the first gun, while Sergeant Lipton was to guard the right flank by getting into a tree and laying down cover fire. Gunners Plesha and Rainey were to set up their 30 caliber machine guns and cover the assault. Then they were to move the guns forward after the first German gun was taken. Malarkey could see the German artillery gun through the hedge grow as he moved into position. He readied a hand grenade by pulling the pin then with a lob over the hedge threw it into the German gun position. 
Just as he released it, a burst of submachine gun fire erupted that ripped through the German position, killing the crew before his grenade had even exploded. The assault of the guns of Braycourt had begun. Lieutenant Winter's squad quickly rushed into the first gun position, securing it with only one casualty. Malarkey quickly broke through the hedge to join Winter's squad in the gun position. A German gunner that had not been killed got up and ran across the field towards Braycourt. He was quickly gunned down by the Americans. Malarkey thought he saw a holster on the dead soldier. He fell to the ground next to the body and realized that the holster was really a leather case for the gun sight. He miraculously made it back to cover next to Sergeant Garnier's position. Bullets from two to three German machine guns were kicking up dirt all around his hiding place under gun number one. Garnier told the private to stay put until he could time the burst from German guns and he could make a dive towards his position. At the right moment of timing, Malarkey made a successful three-foot dive into Garnier's position where they both returned fire on the enemy. Gun number two was being attacked. Moving towards it down the trench, Malarkey was stopped by Lieutenant Winters who ordered him to assist the gunner on his 30 caliber machine gun. Gunner Petty had been wounded and the 30 caliber was needed to cover the next assault. After assisting on the machine gun and covering the assault on the other guns, Lieutenant Winters sent Malarkey on another important assignment, to cover their right flank. Malarkey moved down the trench and into his new position. I secreted myself at the base of a hedge grove. The vegetation was a combination of stinging nettles and blackberry. There he peered through the hedge into the field where he'd fired at what Germans he saw. He heard German voices on the opposite side of the hedge and using the two German grenades he had picked up, he tossed them over the hedge and fell back to La Grande Chimie with the rest of Easy Company. The mission had been a success. Malarkey remembered that the Germans seemed to be based out of the Brayer Court Manor. So he retrieved a 60 millimeter mortar tube in about seven rounds and headed to where he could see the top of the manor. There he fired all his rounds at this target. In 1984, while visiting the manor with his wife, Mr. Malarkey was told by the owner of the manor what the effect of those rounds were. They'd been very accurate and had taken out several Germans who were in the courtyard that day. After firing, Malarkey could not remove the tube from the dirt. The force of the mortar blast had driven the tube a foot into the ground. While struggling to remove the tube, a local Frenchman came to his aid with a shovel and assisted the private in digging out his mortar tube. The battle for the guns of Braycourt stands out in the memory of Mr. Malarkey to this day. The battle was crucial in assisting in the landing of Utah Beach and in allowing the Allies to gain a foothold in France. For their efforts, the 12 Easy Company men involved in this action were decorated for bravery and ingenuity against a superior enemy force. Private Malarkey was awarded the Bronze Star for his part in this engagement. After this battle, Malarkey and Sergeant Garnier retired to a barn to catch a few minutes sleep. Soon after they fell asleep, Sergeant Lipton found them and told them they needed to see Lieutenant Winters. By this time, the tanks from Utah Beach had come up and linked the paratroopers with the seaborne troops. Winters ordered Garnier and Malarkey to lead the tanks to Brave Court and have them mop up the area. Easy Company spent 23 days on the line fighting through the town of Carenton against German paratroopers before they were relieved by the 83rd Infantry Division. They had landed in Normandy on June 6, 1944 with 139 men. They came out on June 29, 1944, with 74 men. Don Malarkey fought with Easy Company through the rest of the war, making one more combat jump during the invasion of Holland and helping defend the town of Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge. Thankfully, he was never wounded while fighting some of the toughest battles of World War II. He rose to the rank of technical sergeant, where at the end of the war, after being part of the U.S. troops who took Hitler's Austrian Alpine retreat, he returned home. There, he enrolled at the University of Oregon in Portland and earned his bachelor's degree in business and a minor in political science. Today, Don Malarkey lives with his wife in Salem, Oregon. He reflects back on his days with the U.S. military with great pride. By war's end, Easy Company had lost 48 men, with an additional 100 wounded. All of these men were brave soldiers who answered their nation's call.